In Vietnam, his job was to dispose of enemy personnel. To kill them. Period. Win by attrition. What do you want to do with the gasoline station? Blow the shit out of it. Blow the shit out of it? Blow the shit out of it. Sure pick one hell of a guy to mess around with. John Rambo is a Vietnam vet. He's a Green Beret, Congressional Medal of Honor. Rambo did bring out a darker side of me. You better be careful about the engines of violence you create because they can turn on you. We're dealing with somebody who had a complete mental breakdown as a result of his experience in Vietnam. It wasn't my war, and I did what I had to do to win, but somebody wouldn't let us win. The metaphor of the long-term effects of the Vietnam War on America. It's all in the past now. For you! For me, civilian life is nothing! There was a time when he was very special. Special my ass. He was just another drifter that broke the law. Well, you did some pushing of your own, John. They drew first blood, not me. They drew first blood. We were uh, basically breaking a little bit of new ground. It was the first time, I think, that we had had this kind of like super soldier now declare war with high-tech weapons on his own country. We've seen, you know, renegades this and renegades that, you know, the anti-hero, but not to this degree and not with this kind of uh, lethal ability. I had students just back from Vietnam who had a whole lot of trouble accepting me as an authority figure. Uh, many of them were younger than I was. And what gives you the right to tell us what to do when we've been over there risking our life for our country? So uh, I used to hang around after class to talk to them to try to understand what was going on in their minds. They would tell me about how they had trouble sleeping, how they had nightmares, how if they heard backfires or loud noises, it wasn't uncommon for some of them to dive to the pavement. It was then I began to learn about certain uh, behavior patterns that we now call post-trauma stress. And I thought what I would do was write a novel which was about a version of the students who might have had. The book was published in 1972. Larry Terman took it to Columbia Pictures. Columbia immediately turned around and sold the property to Warner Brothers. Robert Shapiro, who had been my agent, was then vice president of Warner Brothers. And he came to me one day and he said, would you like to do, develop this script? So I read the script and I read the book and there was a whole pile of scripts. And the best scripts of all was the one that was written by Michael Kozel and uh, William Sackheim. Bob Shapiro said to me after I kind of struggled about working on it for three months, he said, we decided we're not going to make this film. I said, what? I said, but Bob, I've been working on it for three months. He said, yeah, but just too close to the Vietnam War and people in America just don't want to hear about the Vietnam War. Dale Ma's gone. All that orange stuff that spread it around. Cut him down to nothing. I had mixed feelings about the war in the beginning. I was very much behind the war. And then I, I felt that the uh, soldiers were getting kind of a raw deal because uh, around 70, he realized there was no chance for us to win this war. It became a different kind of war, a war of attrition. And the soldiers had no choice. I had a real problem with calling them baby killers and spitting on returning GIs. I thought it was horrible. I know they've been terribly slighted. And then these gentlemen, Mario Kossar and Andrew Banya, heard about it and you know decided to see if they could have a chance at it. Well, First Blood was, you know, everybody thinks of us as the beginning of Carolco, although Carolco was around for some eight years prior to that, surviving on, on handling foreign sales for various producers. They were living in a very, very modest way, and we became very friendly with one another. And one day, they said to me, do you, is there any, I'd like, we'd like you to make a film for us. Do you have anything you want to make? And I said, yeah, you know, I developed, I worked on a script at Warner Brothers, which is a great property it's called First Blood. And at that time, it was the most optioned script in Hollywood. 26 scripts, I believe. Uh, went through three, four, five studios. It was kind of a very strange intuition. We thought immediately about Stallone. So I remember we sent it to him on a Monday, and on Tuesday afternoon, Sylvester Stallone answered that he was going to do it. And I had this, in the whole history of my filmmaking, 40 years of directing films, the first time that I, A, I got my first choice, B, that I got it within 24 hours. We proposed it to him and he was interested. And at one stage, Sly kind of changed his mind. It was kind of a, 
a jinxed project. It had been around uh, to many actors and had gone through many changes with directors and I was very nervous. As a matter of fact, I, the day of filming I was hoping that it would never happen, that we would just go away. And it didn't. And then I looked at Andy and I said, he maybe not, doesn't want to act it anymore, but he's got the character so much, he's been so much involved. Maybe we can ask him to just finish, you know, writing it. And then, of course, what happened is once he started writing it, it came back to him and he said, well, that's me. Why am I not acting in it? I said, well, there's got to be a reason that everyone else has passed except me. And so I, I didn't go into it saying, oh, yeah, this is going to be a winner. And, of course, everybody in town thought, here are the two foreigners. What are they doing? In fact, we asked ourselves what we were doing. Both Warren and I, as two young kids on the blog, they said, they're never going to deliver a movie with Stallone. I mean, you're out of your mind. So nobody bought it. First Blood was very strangely financed, actually. I had my, my godfather, who was a banker in France, and I said, uh, will you do me a favor? He said, what? I said, I believe a lot in this book that I want to make a, into a movie, and I need a loan. He said, OK. I said, how much is the loan? And I don't know how actually I pronounced it, but it came out. I said, 18 million. And he said, well, can you, because in those days that was the word, can you pre-sell, can you cover, Are you, will you be okay? I said, oh, sure, no problem. Because in my mind, I was going for it. The problem was, in the novel, I had a very angry character, and he practically destroys that town. He's relentless when he finally gets angry. We didn't want to make this guy a crazy murderer, which is what the script, script felt like. Look, John, we can't have you running around out there wasting friendly civilians. There are no friendly civilians. I think in the original Kozel Sackheim script, he, like, he killed 18 people. It was like target practice for him. We wanted to make him more like a guy who was really lost and he didn't know what to do with his life and, and he was a victim of circumstances. Stand right where you are! Give yourself up! I didn't do anything! One thing that Sylvester has, he's a great popular sense. He knows what the movie public likes to see and what they don't like to see. He said, how about if he never kills anybody? I said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. He maims them. He puts them out of action. People think it's too violent. If you look at it, he never kills a single human being. I could have killed them all. I could have killed you. I've been telling you the law. Not you, it's me. Don't push it. One person gets killed because of his own stupidity in taking off his safety belt in the helicopter. I wanted Brian Dennehy to play the part of Sheriff Teasel. I've always had tremendous respect for him. As an actor, he's a great actor. Look at him, it's our gold boy. He and I were friends when your mama was still wiping your nose. He made that redneck sheriff jump right off the, the screen. I have a possessed God in heaven to make a man like Rambo. God didn't make Rambo. I made him. The original choice for Troutman was uh, Kirk Douglas, who I idolized as a young man. It was very interesting in those days because Kirk Douglas in the foreign marketplace was more important than Stallone. So when we tried to put together this package that we were going to sell, uh, Kirk Douglas was an important part of it. And we gave the script to uh, Kirk Douglas and he liked it, but he had no script approval. Now when he arrived in the wilds of British Columbia where we were shooting in midwinter, um, he wanted a lot of changes. He is a very uh, opinionated guy and we laugh about this all the time that he basically accepted the script and then rewrote it and not a bad it did a good job but it it wasn't what we had agreed to do there were some changes that were to be forthcoming and uh, I guess he felt that they weren't uh, they weren't done to his liking or they weren't done the way he thought they should be done because no 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 Rambo must die Rambo must die I said I understand that, but not in this movie. Oh! Big revelation to people who don't know the novel. At the end, uh, Rambo dies. Colonel Troutman, the man who created him, he's the guy that kills Rambo. I just don't think it should be done. It, it sends out the wrong message. I mean, every Vietnam vet who sees this goes, oh, the only solution is that death is only the only thing that awaits us at the end of the, the tunnel. And I don't think that's the right way to do it. He goes, yes, but it's artistic. And finally, Buzz Feichens and I trudged with the script and said, Kirk, we want you to do it. Here's the script. 
tell us yes or no. Well, the next day, all we know is that Mr. Kirk Douglas, because you know the pages come in and things like this, has his uh, car waiting outside his trailer, jumped in it, went to the airport, and took the flight back to Los Angeles. I'm gonna come in there and fly you the hell out. I saw him years later, he goes, you know what? My way was still the better way, Sly. It was artistic, but then again, it would have cost you about a billion dollars, so, so maybe I'm wrong. If you listen to me, you would have been broke, but politically and artistically correct. I recall Andy and Mario both uh, scrambling very hard to try and uh, find someone to replace him. I got a call from my agent. It was uh, late on a Saturday afternoon. The good part is they want you to play Colonel Troutman. That's the good part. The second part, they want you to start Monday. Richard arrived during the day. He flew up from Los Angeles. That night he was shooting. And he said, Ted, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where this character is going. You've got to just feed me line by line and tell me what I'm doing in this picture until I get caught up. Don't forget one thing. What? A good supply of body bags. And from there on, he became Troutman. Somewhere in this rugged mountain countryside, possibly above the snow line, shrouded in mist, the fugitive John Rambo is hiding. The locations there were absolutely wonderful. It was the really the, the rainforest, the wet rainforest up there. It rained every day while we were shooting. I had to change my, my clothing two or three times, two or three times a day. The temperatures were extraordinary. We really got down to 40 degrees below with the wind chill. And I'm standing there, I've got on my long underwear, I've got on three layers of socks, I've got my gloves, I've got my green beret, I've got all this, and Sly is standing there in a t-shirt. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm cold. But it was wonderful, everything was always wet and uncomfortable. You, you really felt for, the, for poor uh, Rambo, stripped to the waist with that pathetic little piece of tarpaulin over his shoulders. My one regret in uh, First Blood is that I should never have worn a tank top. He definitely should have worn Gore-Tex because it was that cold, so if we had to do it over again, I think I would have kept my shirt on. It got awful cold. It was his uh, example that I think made all of us <laughs> live through the, uh, the extreme uh, cold that we had to live through. Well, Rambo was the best. A man who's been trained to ignore weather, ignore pain. That took like 19 takes of this thing, and Sly was black and blue by the time, uh, you know, the shot was over. There was a... Uh, a vast array of stunts that were very, very, very dangerous. As a matter of fact, the first stunt uh, um, was falling through the tree. We had gotten it on the first take. We did two more takes, and I said, please, can we stop now, because it's starting to hurt. Of course, on the fourth take, I broke my ribs and uh, bruised my spleen, and so, and then began the saga of the constant uh, journey to the emergency room all the time, getting sewn up here, breaking fingers, breaking this. 75% of what he was doing, he was doing it. And a lot of the very difficult stunts he was doing. I don't want any more hurt! The other problem with Vancouver was that uh, it's very dark in the winter time, so it's uh, very, very difficult to, uh, to shoot there. I adored Andy Laszlo. He's one of, of course, one of the great cinematographers. We used Fuji film, and he really pushed it. For example, there's a that wonderful scene in where Rambo is entombed in a cave, and he said to the department, "Yeah, give me two matches, please." So we took two matches, and he stuck them. Give me some glue, please, and he stuck them together. He said, "All right, Ted, we're lit." You don't notice that it's two matches stuck together, but it's it was that one match, and he lit that scene. We just love Jerry's music. We think that Jerry's music added an emotional quality to the films that he had scored that would be really important to soften this character because he, was, he came across as a very harsh human being on, on, just on film. And when Jerry's score gets added to that mix, it becomes a wonderfully emotionally touching story. I said to him, you know, when he sees that dead sheriff on the thing, he has memories, horrid memories of all the dead corpses that he ever saw in Vietnam. They all come flooding at him. Oh, 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 oh. 
and the music for that moment is absolutely spectacular. In the original book, John Rambo did die because he was at the point of no return. He had been so damaged by all the traumatic experiences that he incurred in Vietnam that he became non-refundable, irredeemable. Rambo! Rambo, don't do it! He knows when Troutman comes into that police station where he's holed up and surrounded by the police and by the military, he knows why Troutman has come there. It's got enough damage! This mission is over, Rambo. Do you understand me? This mission is over! And he says to him, you've got a gun under your tunic, haven't you? And Troutman says, yes. And he pulls it out. And he says, you created me. You trained me. Now you kill me. And Troutman raises the gun, but he can't bring himself to kill this creation of his perfect, his perfect, the perfect soldier, practically. And Sylvester reached out, presses the trigger, and he blows himself away. There was quite a lot of controversy internally about how the movie should end. And I remember one famous line from Sly who told me, just remember Rocky. You can't kill Rocky! I said, it's not Rocky, it's Rambo. <laughs> you never kill your hero at the end or something like that. And we had a test screening in Las Vegas with this ending. And the audience were into it. I mean, we felt immediately we had a success on our hands. You could just tell this kind of visceral reaction to the people. People were all into it. You know, my God, they're all with him all the way, all the way. Like... And suddenly, there was a dead silence when he got killed. And a voice said, if this director is in the audience, he should be strung up to the nearest lamppost. Not the sort of ending that an audience would want to see. I think we were so much on Rambo's side by that time that we didn't want to see him die. We wanted to see him successfully get on with his life. We just ultimately decided that making him live was the right way to go. You're the last of an elite group. Don't end it like this. Back there, I can fly a gunship. I can drive a tank. I was in charge of million dollar equipment. Back here, I can't even hold a job. Fucking guys! He basically has a nervous breakdown and cannot deal with all the pent-up stimulus that he's been forced to absorb. And then it explodes in a frenzy where he cannot keep all the thoughts together. An ongoing stream of consciousness that eventually led him to be so helpless and goes into Colonel Troutman's arms. At the very end, the man, the warrior, becomes the child again and Troutman becomes a father figure. So in the very end, Rambo really did need love, they needed some kind of human contact. They didn't know they had started a war that they could never win. Sylvester Stallone in First Blood. All the foreign distributors came to the Avco Embassy Theater in Westwood. At the end of the screening, it was like the New York Stock Exchange. They went crazy. They went totally crazy. All the exhibitors jumped to their feet and they were screaming at Andy Vanya and, and Mario Pissar across the room making bids for the distribution of this picture. Poor Andy and Mario were pinned up against the wall by three Japanese. We want this film. They're waving checks in the face of Andy and Mario. We want that. Give it to me. It's mine. Within two hours, all the foreign was sold at very high prices. We managed to se segregate or separate the rights in the United States, which nobody has ever done before. That we had a different distributor for video, for cable, and for ultimately for domestic. And the two were never cross-collateralized. So we really ended up with a form formula that was unique in the business by chance and consequently the film made a lot of money for us. Most everyone loves to side with the underdog as we all love rooting for Rocky in his screen battles. But now we see a different side to Sylvester Stallone. As John Rambo he brings out a character as heroic as perhaps someone we've all known in this his latest film First Blood. Release I think in October I think it was a, a, at that time it was a, a picture that uh, that had the biggest release in October maybe in history. Uh, that's, that's not a month where, where big pictures are usually released. They're usually saved for the Christmas holidays. I think in those days, I think it's seven million dollars the first weekend, which was huge. But was in, what was interesting about it is that the next weekend it did seven, and the following weekend it did seven, and the thing never dropped. Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, when they were together talking about the film and talking about oh my god, all this destruction of private property, they sounded like the Chamber of Commerce. It was the nature of the film itself. The story appealed to the American public. It, it, it came out at the right time. By 1982, 
I think the American public realized that the Vietnam veterans had been treated very shabbily and it was a mood of guilt about it. And they felt that the, Amer the Vietnam veterans were being used as a scapegoat for all their negative feelings about the war. The message was that we shouldn't be so hard on, you know, the bearer of bad news. These people were just doing a job and I felt that at the very end, the speech that Rambo gives about wanting to come back, that really he's America's child and, and I was just doing a job and now I came to get a job parking cars back here. What did I do wrong? I was just being patriotic. I went to a cinema in Times Square and Broadway and I've never seen such and a visceral response to the film. They went crazy over this film. Yelling, yelling, scream, get him, get him out. Something that was the most extraordinary, yelling at the screen. I've never seen anything like it. I like First Blood the most of all of them. It seems that everything that the character uh, achieved and conceived was possible. And uh, men in the audience could say, yes, if I were put to the task, I perhaps could do that too. All modern action movies come from first blood. To get a job done, to actually succeed, you're going to have to burn bridges. You're going to have to go to areas deep inside of you that may not be to other people's likings. You're going to have to break protocol. And that's what the message was. To get a job done, right, you sometimes have to do it yourself, whether it's popular or not. It's over, Jenny. It's over! Nothing is over! Nothing!